So we ended our last class just beginning to look at uh, how buffers work from a quantitative standpoint. Uh, what we did talk about so far was the idea that a buffer uh, acts to prevent a change in pH, assuming we have an addition of either a strong base or a strong acid. And the way that it uh, prevents that pH change is that strong acid or base that is added will react with either the strong or the uh, the weak acid if you add a uh, the strong base, or it'll react with the conjugate base if you add the strong acid, and that's what going to re react with first. Okay. Uh, so what we basically left off with was the beginnings of a uh, buffer calculation um, where we start out with a, a buffer solution. So uh, one, of the, one of the things we're going to actually have as one of our labs is calculating how to make a buffer. And so that one is uh, two weeks from yesterday. The Monday lab that uh, bef that first exam is a calculation and preparation of a buffer solution. So it's not trivial. Um, it's good to know more about uh, buffers before you actually do that calculation. Um, and it's basically a worksheet that we'll, we'll go through uh, during lab. Uh, uh, but basically, once you have a buffer made, you can utilize that buffer uh, to see how effective it will be at maintaining. Bye bye, Sophia. Hold on one second. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, guys. There we go. I'm a little bit. There we go. Okay. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll take that buffer that we started with uh, again. So we'll just kind of rehash this buffer from last time. Um, it, the buffer solution that we're going to be dealing with uh, is a has a total volume of 100 milliliters. Uh, and in that 100 milliliters, the concentration of acetic acid is 0.5 molar and the concentration of sodium acetate is also 0.5 molar. Something we will explore later uh, is uh, the relative uh, amounts of each that conjugate acid or that acid and its conjugate base. Right now we're using equal amounts, uh, but we'll see that obviously the uh, a given buffer solution doesn't have to have equal amounts of those things. Okay? Now this initial pH is going to be 4.754, and that's something that we'll have a better understanding of again uh, why it has that uh, as we go through this, uh, the calculation, okay? So our buffer solution is acetic acid uh, and sodium acetate. And so when we think about a buffered solution, that buffer solution has an original uh, concentration to it, okay? Um, and so that original concentration of that buffer or of the uh, acid and its conjugate base are what we saw, but as we add uh, an acid, and so we're gonna calculate the pH after we add the acid. So we're gonna add this small amount of a very strong acid and see what does that do to the pH. Um, when you have the buffer, we're gonna find that it's gonna, as we know what a buffer does, right? It, it stops the change in pH from being uh, very large when you add that strong acid. So what we're going to compare is uh, the buffer and uh, the pH change uh, for the buffer when you add that HCl to what happens if you just add that HCl to water. So our first calculation is going to be with the buffer and then we'll see well what would have happened if we just added that HCl to water and we'll compare those things and see how that, uh, that buffer uh, maintains or at least prevents a large change in that pH, okay? So again, our uh, weak acid is sodium, excuse me, is acetic acid. Our conjugate base comes from sodium acetate. Uh, so the important part there is that, um, is the, the common ion, the acetate ion, okay? 
okay? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna make this chart. Um, you call it whatever kind of chart you like. It's kind of like an ice chart, but it's basically a way of showing what the concentrations of conjugate acid and base are before a reaction occurs and then after the reaction occurs, okay? So um, I've just got it sort of nicknamed a BAN chart. It's kind of like ice charts. Um, and so you'll see, if you look online, you'll see resources where people call this an ice chart. I try to give it a different name just to distinguish between uh, how these charts work. Basically, the whole idea of this type of chart as compared to an ice chart. Remember, an ice chart is just a, hey, find the concentration at equilibrium chart. This particular chart, it shows uh, the chemical reaction that takes place Um, and that chemical reaction leads to, as you can see, a new number of moles of the buffer, right? New and a new concentration for the buffer. And that new concentration uh, for the buffer can be used to calculate uh, the, the pH of a solution, okay? And so let's start to put this together. We've got 100 milliliters of 0.5 molar acetic acid and 100 milliliters uh, or rather I should say 100 milliliters of 0.5 molar acetic acid and 0.5 molar sodium acetate all together in the, that, that 100 milliliter solution. And so if we look at this first, so over here on the right in that is that little chart, that's the BAN chart, the Ben chart, whatever you want to call it. Um, in that initial solution, we have concentrations as listed in the question, right? The 0.5 molar both uh, sodium acetate or acetate and acetic acid. Uh, it's important for us to convert that into moles because we're talking about a chemical reaction between the um, acetic acid and, or the, so, uh, the acetate with the addition of the, in this case, a strong acid. Right? We could do the same thing with a strong base. It would just have the reverse or the opposite effect of what we're gonna do. So when you do this calculation, you can see, well, we can determine the moles of the weak acid by multiplying uh, the concentration times the volume. And so we put that concentration of the weak acid in here. Uh, the concentration of the weak base we put over here. Uh, and we now have how many moles of both the weak acid and weak base there are in this solution. Now in this chemical reaction, we know that we have, we're adding uh, HCl. So HCl is an acid, right? And so that acid is gonna react with the base. But before we look at the reaction, uh, we wanna know how many moles of the acid are there because in the stoichiometry, we're always interested in the moles of one reactant and moles of the other. And so first off, we can calculate how many moles of HCl there are just by multiplying the volume uh, that we add, that 10 milliliters of 0.1 molar HCl. So we multiply the volume times the concentration. And over here in the chart, you'll notice uh, if you add an acid, you're gonna take away some of the base. And so you're gonna have a minus the number of moles of acid that you add uh, from the initial number of moles of the conjugate base. And you're gonna add that to the moles of the weak acid because as we know, when you add a strong acid to a buffer, it reacts with the conjugate base to form more of that weak acid first. And so uh, what happens is we get a change here and a new concentration of the strong acid uh, where we add the moles of uh, strong acid to the moles of weak acid. And so that's what's going on here. Um, and we add the moles of uh, the uh, so we subtract the moles of the strong acid from the moles of the conjugate base because of the reaction that occurs uh, using up that small amount of the conjugate base. Uh, and so we put that, of course, over here. Okay. But when we're doing a calculation here, we're really interested mostly in the concentrations of the, uh, of the buffer at, after the reaction has occurred. And so we're going to convert those back into concentrations, and we do so just by dividing by that uh, total volume. Now we'll see that that doesn't always matter here. Uh, the most important thing is the ratio of the moles of uh, weak acid to the moles of conjugate base. And so we'll see how that works um, in, in just a little bit. Okay. But this is the chemical reaction that occurs when you add that uh, 
strong acid to, uh, to the buffered solution. And so from here, we can now make an ice box. We can see that we take that, those values from the, the new concentrations of the buffers that we figured out in the BAN chart. Uh, we subtract off X, right, as you can see here for the change, and we have an equilibrium concentration of the two, right? Uh, for the hydronium ion concentration, we are still assuming that the initial concentration from uh, the autoionization of water is going to be negligible. Uh, and so we just can say, well, for every amount of the, um, the weak acid that dissociates, we get some amount of hydronium. And for the amount of weak uh, base that dissociate, uh, rather from the amount of weak acid that dissociates, we get some amount of weak base. And so we get these values that will be there at equilibrium. Okay, um, and so when we do this now, uh, we can uh, plug in those values into our equilibrium constant expression like you see here, right? But uh, something that we saw in our previous example, so I'm gonna go back to that example. We already know that that X is gonna be really, really small compared to both of the concentrations of the weak acid and its conjugate base. So if we go back up to uh, where we did the example back, way back in here, right? Um, so in this particular one, right? This particular example, we saw that that X value was on the order of 10 to the minus five, right? That 10 to the minus five is significantly smaller than the 0.5 molar. So we're going to use that that we, we just proved in that particular example to go back here and say, well, let's forget about these, right? So let's forget about those pieces. And when we do that, uh, our equation looks like this, and we can solve for x, and we wind up getting a value for x, which is the concentration of the hydronium ion uh, that you see there. Okay. And so when you plug that value in to the pH as your concentration of hydronium, you get a value for your pH of 4.738. Now, just as a reminder, we're gonna go back to the, the initial page of this. The original pH is 4.754. So 4.754 to 4.738. So it's a small change in the pH with that addition of uh, the 10 milliliters of acetic acid to that original 100 milliliter solution. Okay, so that's the first part of this. Pretty simple to calculate here. Now, that again, here's our original concentration, or excuse me, our original pH of the buffer, and the final pH is what we had here after we added that 10 milliliters of, of uh, uh, 0.1 molar HCl. But before we go on and, and look more at the calculation a little bit in depth, um, what would have happened if we just took 100 milliliters of distilled water and added uh, some, uh, that same amount of HCl to it? So in this case, we're gonna say, well, we've got 100 milliliters of distilled water. That initial pH of that distilled water, well, it's distilled water at 25 degrees Celsius, so it's gonna have an initial pH of seven. If you were to add now 10 milliliters of 0.1 molar, uh, you could calculate the pH of that solution. And so you find out first how many moles of HCl you have just by multiplying volume times concentration. And then of course, divide that by the new volume, uh, which is the original volume, that 100 milliliters plus the added volume. And so you get a concentration of HCl of 0 0.00909, right? Um, and you wind up uh, plugging that into the pH equation. And you do that because HCl is a strong acid. And when you do that, you get a pH of, you get a pH of 2.041, right? So if you think about it, right, that's 2.041. So if you look at the four uh, water, right, you get a pH change where it goes from seven to two, and there we go. So that's a big change, right? That's five pH units, 
right? When we had the buffer and we added that same amount of uh, strong acid, you had a difference of 0 0.16 pH units. Okay, and the reason that that happened is because that strong acid first reacted with the conjugate base rather than reacting with the water to form more hydronium. Okay, and that's the sort of the take home here. That's how the buffer works. The strong acid or strong base that gets added reacts with the buffer before it reacts with any water to produce more hydronium or hydroxide. Okay. And so turns out, so all of this stuff here that we, we, we went through um, uh, in, in this bit, okay? Actually, you know what? I'm gonna take us back a little bit farther. All of the stuff we did in this calculation, because, because in this calculation, our uh, X, right? Because our X value in this concentration is so, ah, sorry, try that again, is so small, right? Because this value is so small and that X is essentially negligible, that allows us to simplify our equation and make something that's really, really useful for calculating the pH of a buffered solution. Uh, and that pH of that buffer is going to be either, it can be uh, the initial pH or the pH after you add uh, or, uh, any uh, strong acid or strong base. So we're going to go back to the page we were at. And we're going to take and derive an equation here. Okay, so this equation we're deriving, we're going to take the Ka initially. Okay, so we're going to take this Ka and set up the Ka expression like we normally would. Okay, but instead of leaving it as Ka is equal to the hydronium ion concentration times the concentration of the conjugate base divided by the conjugate acid concentration, we're going to solve for our hydronium ion concentration. Okay, so when we do that, uh, we get that, that hydronium ion concentration off to one side and uh, the rest of the equation off to the other. And when it comes to solving for pH, right, we can say, well, to find the pH, we just take the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration, which means we're taking the negative log of the entire other side because those two things are equal. One, you know, what you do to one side of the equation, got to do to the other. And if we use our log math, we can actually separate this such that we have pKa, right, negative log of the Ka, uh, uh, plus the log of the concentration of the um, conjugate base over the conjugate acid. And so I actually skipped a little step here, but it going from here to there, right? If it's negative log of uh, Ka times the hydronium ion concentration, um, actually, let me hit the right button here. All right, so if I look at this, right, say negative log of that times this stuff, right? Okay, so it would be negative log of the Ka, which you get right there, that's the pKa. It would be minus the log of the concentration of the acid over the base. Here, we actually can flip that around by taking the negative of the negative log. So that's why you have the concentration of the base over the acid over in this piece, okay? So that's just some log math there that, that gets you or enables you to flip the uh, conjugate base and conjugate acid from one equation to the next, okay? And so you wind up with this equation where you have the uh, pH is equal to pKa plus the log of the concentration of the conjugate base over the weak acid concentration. And that right there will work because uh, that little x, right, that value uh, that, that we have for the concentration um, uh, change in the weak acid and its conjugate base is so small compared to those concentrations of the uh, weak acid and conjugate base that we don't even have to take into account. And so what's nice about this, this particular equation is called 
uh, the henderson hasselbalch equation, it is super useful for calculating the pH of a given um, uh, buffered solution. However, as you can see at the bottom here, right, this is a, an important aspect of this is that um, it really works, right? It really only works well to calculate the pH of a buffer when the concentration of that, uh, of the, um, of the weak uh, acid and its conjugate base uh, fall between, uh, so that when that ratio of the base to the conjugate acid falls between one tenth and 10, okay? Um, outside of the range, uh, small changes uh, to the concentrations of the weak acid and its conjugate base uh, have a, a larger effect on the change in the pH. And so that's the most effective range for a buffer, okay? And so the henderson hasselbalch equation is your friend. The henderson hasselbalch equation is super useful for calculations of pH uh, for a buffer solution. And what's nice about that and sort of the, the, a key to this is when you want to pick a buffer, the thing for, to pick a buffer to, to decide what, what weak acid and its conjugate base do I want uh, for a buffer to be really useful, well, you want to pick a, a, a weak acid. Let's say you, you have a, let's say you know the pH of the buffered solution you want. Maybe you're mimicking uh, a cell, right? And a cell has a pH uh, somewhere around the pH of water. Uh, but a cell is a buffered solution. And so I, if I want to mimic that cell, I might want a buffered solution that will maintain a pH around seven. And so what I would do is I would pick uh, an acid that has a pKa around seven because a buffer works really, really well at a, uh, in a range of the pKa plus or minus one. And the plus or minus one that that buffer works in is because, well, if the ratio of the conjugate base falls between 0.1 and 10, right? That means that uh, you're adding or subtracting one to the, the pKa. Uh, so when you pick that, that acid that you have, you want the, the pH of the solution to be, or really you want the pKa of the acid to be within about one pH unit of the desired pH, okay? The closer to, that desired uh, pH that the pKa is, the better, okay? And so that leads us into an, uh, a part of a buffer, which is called the buffer capacity. It's basically saying, well, if we compare two different buffers, which buffer is gonna be better? What is it about uh, the relative concentrations or the uh, total concentration of the, uh, the components of that buffer uh, that really helps us to resist change. So we're going to look at buffer capacity, right? The ability of a buffer to resist change in pH. We're going to look at that in two different ways. The first way, as you can see, is the total common ion concentration. When we say the total common ion concentration, we're looking at the total concentration of the weak acid plus the concentration of its conjugate base, because that's what the common ion is associated with, okay? And so just as a general rule, the more concentrated a common ion, right, really the, the larger the sum of the concentration of the weak acid in its conjugate base, the greater the capacity of the buffer to resist a change in pH. In other words, if I add uh, a small amount of strong acid or strong base, it's gonna have a smaller change in pH if the buffer is more concentrated. And that's somewhat intuitive, but let's look at some numbers for that. And then we'll look after that, we'll look at the relative concentrations of the two. So for the total common ion concentration, you can compare two solutions with differing total common ion concentrations. So our initial solution, right? so solution one, you can see has initial concentrations of uh, the um, strong acid, excuse me, of the weak acid and its conjugate base of one molar, okay? And so you can see what we're gonna do is we're gonna say those, each of these solutions that we're gonna look at are two liters total. So we have a total volume of them. Um, when we uh, look at the second solution, the second solution would be two liters, but 
its concentration would be 0.1 molar HA and 0.1 molar A minus. So again, right now we're looking at two solutions that have, each of those solutions has a, a equivalent amounts of weak acid in its conjugate base. However, solution one is much more concentrated than solution two. And so what that means is when you think about the uh, number of moles of weak acid and its conjugate base, right? Solution one will have more moles of weak acid and conjugate base than does solution two, okay? But now if we add uh, 0 0.05 moles of HCl, okay? So we're just gonna add that same number of moles of strong acid to the original uh, buffer solution for each of solution one and two. So what happens is uh, if you add acid to solution one, you increase the value of uh, you increase the value of the um, weak acid and decrease the value of the moles of weak uh, conjugate base, uh, and then you can calculate the new concentration of each of those two. Uh, components of the, the buffer solution. And so to calculate the pH of that first solution, you just take the pKa plus the log of the concentration of the conjugate base over the acid, and you see we get a solution that has a new pH, the pH of 4.73. So the pH decreased by a small amount, right? The pH, as you can see, decreased by 0 0.02 pH units. Um, if you take that same amount of uh, strong acid, right, and you add that same amount of strong acid here to the uh, solution number two, which has less total amount of acid and conjugate base, you can see you can do the calculation to get the new amount of uh, weak acid and its conjugate base with new concentrations of, con of weak acid and conjugate base and you plug those values into that henderson hasselbalch equation, right? And you wind up getting a pH of 4.53, okay? Now, in the initial solutions, in both of these initial solutions, the pH was 4.75, okay? You can see 4.75 and 4.75 for that initial pH uh, of that solution. Here though, for the solution number two, the pH has a much greater change, right? Because the relative amounts of uh, base to acid change a whole heck of a lot more with the same number of moles of acid being added. And so what you can say here, what this uh, example demonstrates is that the more concentrated buffer has the greater capacity. It's a better buffer in terms of uh, in terms of preventing the change in APH, okay? And so assuming uh, you wanna prevent change in pH, you wanna have a more concentrated buffer. And now does that mimic the biological uh, system that we're looking at? Well, maybe, maybe not. And so uh, adjusting the total concentration to mimic, so if, you're, if you're trying to mimic a cell, adjusting the total concentration of your uh, conjugate uh, acid and base pair um, is going to be uh, of utmost importance to really mimicking the cell in particular. But if you're just looking at preventing pH change, more concentrated is better. So that's the total ion concentration, right? The total common ion concentration. If instead we wanted to think about, well, relatives amount, relative amounts of the concentration of the weak acid and its conjugate base. Okay, so here, what we can do is say, well, if we're gonna compare relative amounts, the, uh, an important thing that we wanna do is keep one other thing consistent, and that's the total amount of the uh, common ion. And so here, we're gonna compare, um, we're gonna compare uh, two solutions that are both, again, two liters, just like in the last example. Um, here, though, they're gonna have the same common ion concentration, right? In the last example, different common ion concentration. So the common ion concentration for both of these is gonna total uh, one molar, okay, for both solutions. But we're gonna have different relative amounts of weak acid in its conjugate base. So in the first example, we're gonna have, uh, as you can see, 
this, uh, the relative amount of conjugate acid and base is going to be, well, you're gonna have a 50-50 mixture, okay? So half, uh, half molar will be uh, the, the weak acid and the weak base will also, the conjugate base will also be half molar. In our other example though, um, we're gonna have a much different ratio of the weak acid and, to its conjugate base, okay? So in the, the second example, you'll see we'll have, well, 90% of the common ion is going to be in the form of the, uh, of the weak acid, and only 10% will be in the form of the conjugate base, okay? So as we calculate the number of moles of each of, uh, of, each of these um, uh, components in each of the solutions, right, the, we're going to find we have one mole of, um, of weak acid in the first example, right? Try getting rid of that. So we have one mole of weak acid in that first example, right? And, and one mole of weak base, the conjugate base. Uh, when we add uh, a certain amount of HCl, and again, we're gonna add 0 0.05 moles of HCl here. So when we add that HCl, right, it increases the amount of the weak acid and decreases the amount of the weak base. So we get new moles of weak acid, new moles of weak base, gives us new concentrations of the two, and we can plug those values into our henderson hasselbalch to find the new pH of that uh, solution after we've added the, um, the strong acid. If we go and look at the second solution, which had very, very different amounts of uh, weak acid and conjugate base, and we add that uh, initial uh, uh, amount of uh, strong acid, right, it changes, of course, the amount of, um, of weak acid of the buffer right, increases the amount of the weak acid, decreases the amount of the weak base, base. so we get these two new concentrations, what just happened, try that again. We get these two new concentrations uh, for the weak acid and its conjugate base, and we, when we plug those into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, we get a new pH as well. And so what you can see from these pHs, okay, um, is that the pH of the buffer that had the initial concentrations that were closer together, right, here, okay, so if you look at the initial concentration or the initial pH of that solution uh, versus the final pH, you get a difference of negative 0.04 pH units, whereas if you look at the initial pH of the solution uh, uh, number two, uh, you get a much bigger change in the uh, pH. So instead of 0 0.04 uh, pH unit change, you get point, uh, 0 0.14. So a significantly larger, almost three times larger for uh, this particular example, even though the common ion concentration for these two solutions totals the same. Right? And so the rule of thumb there is uh, for relative concentrations of weak acid to conjugate base, Right, as we had in our rule up here, okay, so the relative concentration of uh, conjugate base uh, to the conjugate acid is when the total ion concentration, so when the total common ion concentration is the same for two buffers, um, the buffer uh, with the concentrations of uh, HA and A minus that are close together, will have the greater capacity, okay, to change the pH, uh, to resist that change in pH, okay? So, moral of the story is if you want a better buffer, one, you want the total common ion concentration to be higher, and two, you want the relative amounts of both the, the acid and its conjugate base to be closer together, okay? And so that's uh, the idea of a buffer capacity. You want them, one, more concentrated is, is, strong, is a stronger buffer, uh, and it's a better buffer when those concentrations are closer together, okay? Okay, so that leads us into uh, titrations and pH curves. So, so far, uh, in Chem 101 class, 
you've done titrations, okay? But you haven't done any pH curves. What a pH curve is, essentially, it's a way of tracking the pH during a titration. Now, you can do this experimentally using a pH meter, but you can make predictions uh, that will sort of help you to understand what goes on during uh, the chemical reaction. Uh, and that's what a lot of the calculations we're about to get into will do for us, okay? So just as a reminder, as far as an experimental setup uh, is concerned, uh, when we do a titration, remember we have uh, a, a sample that we're, we're titrating, right? The sample is the thing in the Erlenmeyer flask, okay? Uh, then we'll also have uh, the titrant, okay? So the titrant is here in the burette, right? That's where the titrant is, uh, right? And then the analyte is the sample that we're titrating. That's the thing that we're looking for, okay? So, All right, I just had an unstable internet connection. I hope you guys, I paused when I saw it, so I hope uh, I didn't lose anything there. Um, <clears throat> but here we go. We've got, let's get into titrations. First off, a titration, just as a reminder, stuff that we've done in a Chem 101 class, right? It's a stoichiometric reaction, uh, usually of an acid with a base. Now, I say usually because most of the time we do titrations that are acid-based titrations. However, there are other types of titrations you can do also. You can do, um, for example, uh, redox titrations where you're looking at a stoichiometric reaction in redox chemistry. Now the same idea is gonna hold. You're gonna have something that indicates the endpoint, some sort of uh, an indicator that tells you about the endpoint. Um, and if that indicator is chosen properly, right, it'll change colors uh, at the same time you reach that stoichiometric point, okay? Now, we're going to talk more about indicators later and, and what it means to change color because I think that it's important that we start to see some of these pH curves and understand that the indicator is really being picked such that uh, it changes color in a certain region of the, the uh, pH curve that, that we're looking at. Basically, it's a region that changes how long did, did, was I lost there for you guys? Like. Is there? Can you guys tell me what slide we were on? Anybody? Oh, here we go. Like a minute. Okay, since the indicator part. Okay. Why is my internet connection unstable? Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay. So let's head back to this. So it looks like the indicator part. So I'll just start again with our titrations and pH curves and we'll, we'll kind of go from there. <laughs> ah, technology. Okay. So let's get back to this. Okay, boom. Okay. There we go. Okay, so we'll pick up, I uh, can't erase this at the moment. The whole idea here, right, we have a titration where the, we're adding, in our case, a strong, uh, well, so we're adding an acid to a base and we get this, uh, have the stoichiometric reaction, okay? We're going to,
we're going to um, really take into account uh, reactions beyond, gosh darn it, what is going on with this thing? Hold on, technical difficulties. Okay, so we're going to take into account uh, more than just when a, a, a titration uh, experiment has a color change. Now you can do a col have a color change from an indicator. The, indi uh, the color change occurs at the end point. Uh, if you've chosen your indicator properly, it's going to occur uh, at the same time as the equivalence point, which is where the stoichiometric amounts of both acid and base are added, okay? So we're gonna explore uh, the uh, indicators a little bit later on, uh, but we need to have more information uh, about uh, what happens during a titration, really to the pH, uh, before we can understand the best time or best indicator to pick for a given titration. So back in uh, Chem 101 or, or Chem 60, you did titrations where your indicator uh, was pink, right? That was phenolphthalein, okay? So phenolphthalein is one indicator out of many, and that indicator uh, changes from clear, right, to pink, very ever so slightly, right? And that was everybody's uh, nemesis for the first day of titrations is getting that correct pink color. So uh, we'll find there are all kinds of different indicators that are useful for different types of titrations. But before we do that, just want to make sure we have uh, an understanding of the components in a titration and some terminology for describing a titration, okay? The first we've already mentioned, we've seen before the analyte, right? That's the thing that's in the uh, Erlenmeyer flask. That's what we add the titrant to and the titrant comes out of the burette, okay? The titrant is the solution that has the known concentration, at least uh, when you have, um, when you're titrating uh, an unknown sample. Okay, now we, uh, you may have to standardize that concentration like you guys did in Chem 101 uh, with the titration of uh, primary uh, standard, right? Uh, the sodium hydroxide solution that you guys made in Chem 101 was the secondary standard that you standardized by doing the titration of a known analyte, okay? So, um, hopefully that kind of brings a bit of the titrations that you guys did in Chem 101 back to mind. Um, the types of uh, titration curves that we'll do uh, are going to be the three, uh, well, we'll really talk about it, three sort of categories of them. The first one being a strong acid, strong base, uh, and the sec uh, and, or a strong base, strong acid. So in the description, the analyte is listed first and the titrant is listed second. So you would say if you were uh, doing a uh, strong acid, strong base titration, right? You would say that the, uh, you were titrating a strong acid with a strong base, okay? The reverse of that or the opposite of that is if you do a strong base, strong acid titration, you're titrating a strong base with a strong acid, okay? And so the Analyte listed first, the uh, titrant is listed second. That's gonna be the first one. We'll go through uh, examples of the calculations involving strong acid and strong base. Um, uh, other uh, common titrations, and so actually you did, you did a strong acid, strong base titration uh, back in Chem 101 where you titrated uh, hydrochloric acid solution with uh, sodium hydroxide solution that, uh, that you had made. Uh, the, a common one that you've also done is a, a weak acid strong base titration. And so that was when you did vinegar solution, which had acetic acid titrated with sodium hydroxide. But you could do the reverse of that as well, right? You could go and, and uh, titrate a weak base and a strong acid as well. Uh, in that case, if you do a weak base strong acid or a strong base strong acid, the strong acid would be the thing in the burette. Most of the time, uh, just in, in at least general chemistry courses, we usually titrate a, uh, uh, a weak acid with a strong base or a strong acid with a strong base. Okay. 
We'll also look a little bit at polyprotic acids, okay? And a polyprotic acid, you could titrate with a strong base as well. You, uh, and so we'll look a little bit at those and see that uh, for a polyprotic acid, you have multiple uh, hy uh, hydrogen ions, right? Multiple protons that you can remove from that polyprotic acid. And so, and here we are again. Uh, all right, hopefully that was only another 45 seconds or so. You guys all, all there? Let's see where we, where we left off this last time. Polyprotic. Okay, so it, it was just right at the end. Okay, so let's go back to here. Okay. <sighs> okay. Okie dokie. So, right here. All right, so we were talking about a polyprotic acid. What we'll see when we look at polyprotic acids is that there are uh, multiple equivalence points or multiple in, uh, potential endpoints if you have uh, the right type of um, indicator. But the polyprotic uh, acid will have multiple endpoints because it has multiple protons that you can deprotonate. And so we'll look at that uh, in titrations as well. So the first place we're gonna, gonna look, uh, and we're gonna do a couple of examples. We're gonna do, the, the examples that we're gonna look at are strong acid, strong base, and weak acid, strong base. And there are a couple of places in just a generic uh, titration curve that we can look at. So these two titration curves that we have are uh, a, um, so we have a weak or a strong acid uh, titrated with a strong base. And so that's, uh, you can see that that's marked down here, right? So that's this uh, reddish brown curve. Uh, and then the titration of a weak acid with a strong base. And so each of, in each of these cases, the initial starting pH is going, I lost that again, darn it. This is really, there we go. The initial starting pH for each of these is going to be obviously on the, um, the lower end of the pH scale, below seven, because we're starting with the pH and we're monitoring the pH of the, uh, of the analyte as we add uh, the, the uh, titrant to it. So with a strong acid and with a weak acid, we're gonna have essentially three key regions in this, uh, in this titration for in terms of the pH of the analyte solution as we add the uh, titrant to it. The first region that we have, hold on a sec. God, give me a break. Let's see, are we still here? We are not, hold on. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Uh, this is this is a little frustrating today. Sorry, guys. I don't. There's nothing I can do about this. It's the technology. So, 
we'll get through a little bit more today, um, probably a little bit slowly, and then we'll um, we'll figure this this out for next time. Okay, back to it. There we go. Okay, so in this titration, uh, in a titration of a, oh, back to this page, uh, of a strong acid or a weak acid with a strong base, um, we basically have two key regions uh, that we're going to look at. Okay, uh, one of uh, those regions is uh, sort of at low pH. So really, we're talking about somewhere down here, right? So in this region, you generally have a pH that starts out low, right? Whether it's a strong acid or a weak acid, it's gonna start out in the low region and it's gonna increase slowly, okay? Then you get to a point in this titration where when you add uh, a little bit more uh, sodium hydroxide to the solution, the pH increases very, very quickly. Okay, um, we'll, we'll do that calculation, but in that region, you have amounts of both hyd uh, hydronium and hydroxide that are similar. After that, you have a, 30, uh, a third um, area, you know, or third region of this chart that's basically after you get to that equivalence point, um, you'll have a region that has, again, a slow increase in pH uh, as you continue to add more sodium hydroxide to uh, the analyte. Okay. And so what we'll do in here is we're going to start out with uh, a strong acid, strong base titration. Okay. And this strong acid, strong base titration um, is we're going to see, uh, we're going to calculate the pH at the various stages. And part of calculating the pH at these various stages is understanding what's in the solution at any given point in time during the titration. And one of the keys for us in a strong acid, strong base titration is understanding that the strong acid will react completely with the strong base, okay? So what we're gonna initially begin with, okay, the initial uh, solution we're gonna deal with is an analyte that has 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. And we're going to add to that, we're going to add uh, this uh, sodium hydroxide solution that has a concentration of 0 0.100 molar. Okay. And we're going to look at this for a strong acid, strong base titration. We're going to look at this from this uh, at, at four different points uh, during that titration. Okay. So the four points are. Uh, the initial pH. Uh, so before we add anything, what's the pH of that solution? In other words, what's the pH of the, acid, the weak acid solution that you start with? And of course, we or excuse me, of the strong acid solution that we start with. Uh, the pH of a strong acid we know is dependent upon the concentration of that strong acid. We're going to then look at, and so that's going to be right down here, right? This is the initial uh, part of this uh, particular titration. Then we're going to look at uh, the pH before the equivalence point. So the equivalence point is there's an inflection point in uh, the graph right here, right at the middle there. And that's the equivalence point where the moles of acid will equal the moles of base that you added. Uh, so we're going to look at it somewhere in this region down here. Okay. And so that's going to be the second region that we're going to look for the pH of this solution. So that's there. Then we're gonna look at it at, at the equivalence point. So at the equivalence point, what do we have in the solution? So we'll talk about that when we get to that point. And then finally, we're gonna look at the pH after the equivalence point. So basically, if you continue to titrate after uh, your phenolphthalein indicator changes color, what's gonna to happen to the pH then, right? And so um, in the typical titration that you guys did in Chem 101, you stopped when you got to the equivalence point. Okay, because in general, that's where you want to stop in most cases. Um, so here we're going to see what happens if we titrate beyond that. Okay, and so we'll just do um, 
uh, just a little bit of this uh, today, and we'll continue with it tomorrow and on um, and on uh, Thursday. There are a lot of calculations involved in this. So the first one, we're going to calculate the pH uh, at uh, where we have added zero. Um, so we've not added any milliliters of base, so no base whatsoever. So at this point, uh, it's useful to figure out what you have in that uh, solution, right? So right now, with that pH, right, the pH is dependent on just having only strong acid present. Okay, you've not added any base, so it's just the pH is dependent on the initial concentration of the hydrochloric acid. Okay, and so in that case, we're looking at that 0 0.1000 molar uh, HCl. And so for that, since we know, we know how to calculate the pH of a strong acid solution, right? The pH of this solution will equal, right, negative log of the hydronium ion concentration, just based on the pH definition. But since it's a strong acid, that will equal the negative the log of the HCl concentration. So here, your pH will equal negative log of 0 0.1000, okay? And so your pH here will be 1.0000 if I'm using my sig figs, but pH of 1, okay? And so that's your initial pH for this titration, and that pH is, is going to be uh, in really easy to calculate for a strong acid, strong base titration at the start because it's really just dependent upon that initial concentration of the acid. Okay. The second part of this uh, is where we have to start taking into account how much base was added. Okay. And so the, the best way to start out a uh, titration calculation uh, with um, a strong acid and a strong base is to really figure out and, and hammer out uh, something that's going to be useful in subsequent parts of this. And that's going to be the initial moles of the acid. Okay, so the initial moles of acid which if we're doing it, it's really simple, right? It's just the concentration times the volume. So it's 0 0.0500, oh, that's terrible. Try that. There we go. So 0 0.0500 liters, right? That's my 50 milliliters times 0 0.1000 moles of HCl per liter. Okay. So you wind up with 0 0.00500 moles of HCl. Okay, so that's the initial number of moles of hydrochloric acid. You want moles because this is a chemical reaction, right? It is a chemical reaction between HCl and NaOH. And so the next thing to do is figure out, well, because we know the stoichiometry of this reaction, how much uh, base we've added in terms of moles of base is going to be uh, really useful for figuring out how much of the acid remains. So the next thing we're going to look at is the moles of base added. Okay. So moles of base added, all we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, well, we have 25 milliliters of base. So that's 0 0.0250 liters. And we know the concentration of the base is 0 0.1000. Uh, uh, 
moles of NaOH per liter. And so you've added 0 0.00250 moles of sodium hydroxide. Okay. And so in order to calculate the pH of the solution, you need to know first how many uh, moles of acid are remaining and then the concentration of that acid in the solution. So the next calculation is moles of acid remaining. Okay, so moles of acid remaining is going to be the initial moles. So 0 0.0. 0.00500 moles of HCl minus the moles of base, and, and we're going to use a conversion factor to, to get uh, that's the stoichiometric or mole ratio of acid to base in this chemical in this chemical reaction. So here it's going to be 0 0.00250 moles of NaOH that you added times the, the mole ratio. So one mole of sodium hydroxide for every one mole of HCl, okay? And so you wind up with 0 0.00250 moles of HCl, okay? And so that's how many moles of HCl remain. So the last thing that you need to do before calculating the pH is the concentration of HCl remaining. Okay. To calculate the concentration of HCl remaining, it's just as simple as saying, well, I've got the, the moles, 0 0.0250 moles of HCl. Divide that by the total volume. So in this case, we had 0 0.050 liters, plus I added 25 milliliters uh, that didn't have any uh, acid in it. So 0 0.0250 liters, or overall 0 0.0250 moles per 0. Uh, 0, 07, actually, I, I left, left out a zero there. There should be there and there. 0 0.075, ah. Liters, okay? And so you wind up with a value of, uh, 0 0.0333 molar HCl. And then to find the pH, you just plug it into the pH equation. pH is equal to negative log of 0 0.0333. And so your pH of that solution after you've added 25 milliliters of base will be uh, 1.477, okay? All right, and so that sort of gets us started down the road of doing these calculations. Um, so I think I'm actually gonna stop there for today. I know we're gonna end a little bit early. I wanna see if there are any questions, things that we can go back with, but I'm gonna stop sharing uh, our video or stop the, the uh, recording right now and uh, we'll open it up to questions.